Hey everybody, I hope you're doing well. I hope you can hear me okay. In this video, we're going to talk about the ancient calendar that was given to humans by the Elohim and what it represents and even show that a recent major fulfillment of these appointments for the future occurred in 2012. So according to the ancient texts of the Bible, God, otherwise known as the Elohim, made the earth inhabitable, set the moon in motion around the earth so it would perfectly eclipse the sun, and created the constellations and the stories associated with them. And if the Elohim is responsible for all life on this planet, then it seems reasonable that the Elohim would not just give the valuable information to one tribe in one location of the earth, but to all tribes over the entire planet. A complete study of the Elohim's calendar would probably require extensive investigation into the ancient records of all cultures, but for this video, we're just going to focus on the ancient texts that have been compiled in the Bible. So these ancient Hebrew texts are several thousand years old and have been translated and retranslated many times. So try to keep in mind we're attempting to find the original truth that may have been buried or altered over time. The texts seem to imply that the Elohim left at some point in the past, at which time the Yehovah took over. But the texts also tell us the warlike rule of the Yehovah will end after 6,000 years with the return of the just establishment, with the 120 lifetimes being reference to possibly 120 jubilees, which occur every 50 years. We're not going to go into detail about that in this video, but there are several other links in the description below this video if you're interested in finding out more about what we're talking about here. Basically, the 120 lifetimes may be the jubilee years which are 50 years each so 120 times 50 equals 6,000 years well we don't know when that 6,000 year period started exactly but when we take into consideration the research of archaeologists and religious scholars we find this 6,000 year period described in detail in the Hebrew text began around the start of the Bronze Age. So we end up with an approximate thousand year window for the projected end of this 6,000 year period from 1500 CE until 2400 CE. So basically, we're in the middle of that window for the projected return of the just establishment now. So that's why the appointed times are so important right now. Apparently, the Elohim established very specific days that were appointments for the future and told the, Elo the humans to keep observing those days each year in all their generations so they wouldn't forget. The humans were told the appointed times must be determined each year based on the sun and moon. So Genesis 1 is really important with regards to this because it tells us that in order to get the appointments right each year, we must use the sun and the moon, not the ripening of the barley or any other method. The reason for this seems clear in modern times because we know the ripening of the barley is dependent upon the season and the seasons are dependent upon the movement of the earth around the sun. So it makes sense that the Elohim are telling us to use 
not the ripening of the barley, which is dependent upon a higher source, but to use the ultimate cause of the ripening barley, which is the rotation of the earth around the sun in order to determine the appointed times of each year. So what are the appointments of the Elohim? The appointments are usually translated in English as feasts, but the Hebrew word literally means appointed time or appointed sign. And most scholars agree there are seven of these appointed times per year, three in the first month, three in the seventh month, and one in the third. But we're going to take a fresh look at these appointed times in this video. So Leviticus 23 lists them, and the first appointed time is the Sabbath. It's the seventh day of rest. But there's a lot of controversy over this Sabbath day. A lot of religious doctrines argue over whether this seventh day should be observed on Saturday or Sunday or Wednesday, etc. But the words Saturday, Sunday, or any other modern Gregorian calendar weekday are not in the earlier translations of these texts. It simply tells us the Sabbath is the seventh day. So the seventh day from what? Well, since this is the first appointed time, then on one level it may refer to the 7,000th year that represents the return of the Elohim. Since the texts tell us one day is a thousand years, and the seventh day is the blessed day. But on a more simple level, it makes sense that the seventh day would be the seventh day of the month, starting at the beginning of the year. Well, Leviticus 23 seems to confirm this right after it talks about the seventh day, saying the 14th day, which is seven days after the seventh day, is to be the appointed time of Passover. And the 21st day, which is the third Sabbath of the first month, is to be the last day of unleavened bread. And the texts tell us unleavened bread is also a day of rest. So the last day of unleavened bread, the 21st day, according to Exodus 12, 18, is the seventh day from Passover and Passover is the seventh day from the first Sabbath of the year. So this seems pretty straightforward. But the next appointed time is a little more challenging. The Feast of Weeks is a seven week period that begins after the sheaf of first fruits is waved. Specifically, we're told to start counting down 50 days from that day. And when we reach the 50th day, that's the wheat harvest, otherwise known as Shavuot. And this may represent the appointment for the future escape, although we don't know that for certain. We're told to start counting these 50 days on the day after the Sabbath. But which Sabbath is it referring to? It clarifies that it's referring to the Sabbath just before the priest waves the first fruits before the Lord. And here's where it gets really interesting. It tells us that when the Israelites are living in the land of Israel, then they will bring a sheaf of the first fruits to the priest, and the next day, they will sacrifice a lamb without blemish. This is really important because this was the first appointment for the future that has already been fulfilled. Jesus was the lamb without blemish and the first fruits that they crucified on Passover who died and went before the Lord in heaven the next day. This is clarified in the later writings of the Hebrew texts of the Bible. 
Jesus was eating the Passover meal with his disciples when Judas brought the guards to take him away. That's in Mark 14. Then in John 18, we're told he was taken to the high priest, then to Pontius Pilate, but some of them didn't want to go because they wanted to eat the Passover meal. So again, confirming for us that this is all happening on Passover. Then in John 19, it says, Pontius Pilate was preparing to eat the Passover meal when Jesus arrived. Then Jesus was taken and crucified, and all of this was occurring on Passover, the 14th day of the month. Then it says in Matthew 27 that when evening came, the next day, Joseph put Jesus' body into a tomb and Mary was there. So remember, the day starts in the evening and the sheaf of first fruits was waved the day after the Sabbath. So this is clearly happening on the 15th day of the month, the day after Passover. So Jesus was crucified on Passover, and then the next day, on the evening, which was the start of the next day, that was the 15th day of the month. And notice there was an earthquake that happened here when Jesus died on the 14th day. But notice it says down here, the next day that followed the day of the preparation. Well, if we look at the meaning of the word after, we see that it means among. So on the day, on the next day, among the preparations, which makes sense because Passover starts unleavened bread, which lasts seven days. So the next day after Passover, they were still among the preparation of the feast on those days because they were told to make an offering for seven days. So when it says they were preparing, that's what they were preparing. They were preparing that offering each of those seven days. So after Jesus was crucified on the 14th, the next day, among the days of preparation, Jesus was put in a tomb and Mary was there. But the priests were worried that he would rise after three days. So they set up guards to watch the tomb. It doesn't say here that he actually rose after three days. It simply says they were worried that he would rise after three days. This is all still occurring on the 15th day of the first month, the day after Passover, when Jesus was crucified. Then in Matthew 28, it confirms again that Mary was there at the tomb at the end of the Sabbath day, which was the 14th. And the first day of the week was starting. So if the Sabbath is the seventh day, then the first day of the week, of course, is the next day. And notice it confirms that the earthquake happened at that time as well. So we're talking about the earthquake happened when Jesus died, which was at the end of the 14th day and the start of the 15th day. So it tells us here that Jesus rose at the end of the 14th and the beginning of the 15th day. So sometime in there, he rose. So basically, he rose after the Passover. He was the unblemished lamb who died but rose again the day after the Passover, so exactly the way it was written in Leviticus. And he was also the first fruits who was waved before the Lord in heaven the day after Passover. So again, this unblemished lamb right here in Leviticus, in the book of Leviticus here, this 
lamb would die the day after the Sabbath, which is exactly what happened. And also that's the day that the, that the first fruits would be waved before the Lord. So when he died, in a way, he was, he was the first fruit standing before the Lord in heaven. So the counting of 50 days after the first fruits are taken to the priest and waved before the Lord may represent the appointed time of the future escape when the wheat are gathered into the barn. But the wheat that are gathered into the barn in the future escape are not the first fruits. That was Jesus. But if you want to know more about what the texts say about the escape from the serpent, check the link in the description below this video. But for now, we just want to understand why these appointed times are important and how the texts say to determine them exactly. The texts clarify that the Feast of Weeks represents the wheat harvest, which will be 50 days from the waving of the first fruits the day after the Sabbath when the lamb died. So the Sabbath it's referring to is Passover, the 14th day, the second Sabbath of the first month. So the day after that is the 15th day of the month. Jesus was the lamb who died on the 15th day of the first month, the first fruits who was waved before the Lord in heaven on the 15th day of the first month. So day one of the counting of the Omer is the 15th day of the first month, and the 50th day is the appointed time of Shavuot, the wheat harvest. The rest of the appointed times are pretty clear. The appointed time of trumpets will be on the first day of the seventh month. The appointed time of atonement will be the 10th day the ninth and tenth day of the seventh month and the appointed time of tabernacles otherwise known as Sukkot will be a seven day period starting on the 15th day of the seventh month. So there are three appointed times in the first month, three in the seventh month, and one in the third month. And the menorah can be thought of as a representation of this. We have the three in the first month here which are mirror image of the three in the seventh month here and the one in the, in the middle. So the first and the seventh month are important because six out of seven appointed times occur in the first and the seventh month. And the appointed dates of the first and the seventh month are a mirror image of each other. So it's not clear why the appointed times of the first month and the seventh month are a mirror image of each other, but one possibility is that this is an acknowledgement to both the southern and the northern hemispheres of the earth, which experience their seasons in opposite times of the year. But to understand this, we first have to understand when the first and seventh month are meant to be observed. In Deuteronomy, we're told the month of Abib is the month of Passover. And Passover is in the first month. So this means Abib is the first month of the year. Well, the word Abib literally means greening of the crop or barley ears, and this happens in the spring. But when we consider that the calendar was meant to be used over the whole earth, we realize that spring in the northern hemisphere is fall in the southern hemisphere. So when those in the northern hemisphere are observing the first month, those in the southern hemisphere would be observing the seventh month and vice versa. So this may be the reason the appointed times in the first and seventh month are a mirror image of each other. So we know the first month should start in the spring based on the meaning of the word Abib. But when exactly? First of all, we know the months 
start on the new moons or the first visible crescent of the new moon, which is usually the next day. And we know this because the Hebrew word for month literally means new moon. And the texts specifically say to start each month on that day, on the new moon or the first visible sign of it. But which new moon of the spring season should be the first month of the year? We have a clue in Exodus 34. It says, the feast of weeks and the feast of ingathering should be observed at the year's end. But we know the feast of weeks starts in the first month and the feast of ingathering, otherwise known as Sukkot or tabernacles, is in the seventh month. So neither the first month or the seventh month is in the end of the year. So what is this referring to here? Well, this word actually means a turning. So Exodus 34.22 is telling us the Feast of Weeks, which starts in the first month, and the Feast of Ingathering, which is in the seventh month, should be observed at the turning of the year. Well, what is the turning of the year? The turning of the year is the changing of the seasons. It's literally the turning of the earth around the sun and the tilt of the axis that causes the changes in the seasons. So there are four of these turnings per year, spring, summer, fall, and winter. And we know the first month happens in the spring. So the turning it's referring to in that month is the spring equinox. And the turning in the seventh month is the fall equinox. But in ancient times, the humans didn't have scientific means for determining the exact timing of the equinoxes. But it's important to understand how they did determine this if we want to find the true appointments for the future that the Elohim gave them. We don't know how they did it for sure, which is why there's so much debate over the subject, but we do have clues. First of all, and we already talked about this, but they were not told to determine it by the greening of the barley or any other subjective means. Instead, they were told to determine the turning by the sun and moon. So the greater light is the sun and the lesser light of the night is the moon. And those are to be used for the seasons, for the days, and for the years. So the turning of the year would have to be determined by looking at the movements of the sun and the moon from our perspective on Earth. And the first thing the ancient humans may have noticed is that in the northern hemisphere, summer, the sun appears to rise and set more toward the north. So this is facing to the east and the sun is rising more toward the northern orientation in the southern I'm sorry, in the summertime in the Northern Hemisphere. And in the Northern Hemisphere winter, the sun rises and sets more toward the south. So we also observe a similar cycle with the rising of the full moon, only the opposite. In the winter, the full moon rises over the horizon to the north of due east. And in the summer, the full moon rises more to the south of due east. But an easier way to remember this is if you go outside at sunset on the night of the full moon in the summertime, the sun will be setting to the right of due west and the moon, the full moon, will be rising to the right of due east. And in the winter, the sun would be setting to the left of due west while the full moon is rising to the left of due east. So an even easier way to remember this is, if you're living in the northern hemisphere, winter left, 
Summer Wright. So winter left, summer right. And this is the turn of the sun and moon. From, from the, um, at the fall, at the spring and fall equinox, the turn is occurring right in the middle of these two locations from the, the northern and the southern perspective. So this turn of the sun and the moon from the northern to the southern skies each year was the ancient marker of the changing of the season. And this is the turning of the year that will determine when the first month and the seventh month should be observed. So you might think that the ancient people could just project when the turning would occur and start their first month accordingly, expecting the turn to occur sometime during the Feast of Weeks, but it's a little more complicated than that without our modern technology. In modern times on the Gregorian calendar, we know the spring equinox in the northern hemisphere occurs around March 20th. But this is because we add an extra day to the month of February every fourth year, the leap year. And the modern Jews also have a system set up in which they add a 13th month every so many years. But in ancient times, the humans would have had to go outside and watch for the turn. And if you imagine all of the different living conditions all over the earth, it becomes clear how this observance could be very uncertain if you had to try to catch it on the exact day of the turn. Right now we're looking at this software program and we have, and it's very simple for us to look at this and see that, okay, this, this represents west and it's obvious that the sun is perfectly center on west on March 20th. But if you had to actually go outside to watch for the turn with your own eyes, you might have to take a trip to a higher location like the top of a hill or out onto an open plain. And even if you had a marker like a monument or something around your home that marked where the equinox location was, Others might not agree with you, and especially if they were on the other side of the earth, completely unaware of your observations, they might come to a different conclusion. So if this calendar was meant for everyone on the earth, then in order to keep everyone in harmony, it makes sense that they would wait until the sun and moon made a full and obvious turn. So instead of going out every day at sunset waiting for the sun to hit the exact center of due west it makes more sense that they would set a specific day to check for the turn in the 12th month that way if they had to take a trip in order to have a better view of the horizon they wouldn't have to make that trip every day i mean remember most of them were traveling on foot so a trip to the mountains or the plains might take a, a few weeks so it makes sense that they probably checked for the turn on the night of the full moon in the 12th month since the moon is easier to see when it's full and they would have needed to check both the sun and the moon for the turn. And also that would give them two weeks to prepare for the first day of the month, which is the new moon. So we don't know for sure what they did originally because unfortunately the ancient appointed times have been changed and the ancient texts have been corrupted, but we know a lot of the truth is still there in these texts. And we're about to look at some very convincing signs that occurred in recent years on the ancient appointed times that seem to confirm that this method we're about to look at is the method the ancients used to determine the appointed times each year. 
So let's start in 2012 because that's when our first extremely rare and important sign occurred. By this method, we start our observance on the full moon of February. So you can see the full moon is rising to the left of due east, which is still its winter orientation. So if we were living in ancient times, we would wait until the next full moon to check for the turn again. Then on the full moon of March in 2012, it was rising to the right of due east, which is its spring and summer orientation. But both the sun and the moon need to have made their turn, and as you can see, on the full moon of March in 2012, the sun was still setting to the left of due west, which is the fall and winter orientation. So because the turn still didn't occur in March of 2012, we would need to wait until the full moon of the next month to check again. And as you can see, the sun made its full turn by the full moon observance in April of 2012. So now the ancients would know they can start the first month of the year on the next new moon. So the new moon in April 2012 occurred on the 21st, and the first visible crescent of that new moon was the next day on the 22nd. So using the ancient calendar method, the first day of the first month in 2012 was either on the new moon of the 21st or the first visible crescent of the new moon on the 22nd. And that gives us a two-day window for each day. And the rest of the days fall in line, such as Passover on the 14th day from either the new moon or the first crescent. But here's the next point. The ancient days didn't start at the same time our Gregorian days start. The ancient biblical days started at sunset and lasted until sunset of the next day. So when we're looking at the ancient biblical dates on the Gregorian calendar, one biblical day would cover two Gregorian dates. For example, on the Gregorian calendar, this first day, of the month where the new moon is would start on sunset of the 21st until sunset of the 22nd. But here's the next issue. The new moon, as it's recorded by NASA, can't be seen with the naked eye. It's the day when the moon is not visible at all in the sky. So in ancient times, they would go out and look for the first visible crescent of the new moon, which usually occurs the day after. So there's some debate over how the ancients did it, whether they actually started the first day of their month on the invisible new moon or the first visible crescent. So to be safe, we're going to consider both days as the possible start of the months, both the technical new moon and the visible first crescent the next day. This ends up giving us a three-day watch period for every day on the ancient calendar. So for example, we know Passover is the 14th day of the month. So if we count from the new moon right here, this would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and this would be 14. The 14th day would start at sunset on April 4th and last until sunset of April 5th. That's if we count from the new moon. But if we count from the first crescent, Passover would start at sunset on the 5th and last until sunset of the 6th. So that's the three-day window for the appointed time of Passover on the ancient biblical calendar in 2012. Now we count 50 days from Passover to find the appointed time of the wheat harvest, Shavuot. And we know Omer day one is on the 15th day of the month, the day after Passover. So let's look at the first day of this three-day window on starting on sunset of April 4th. 
the next day would begin at sunset on April 5th, so that would be Omer day one, and it's a three-day window as well. Then Omer day seven would be right here. Then Omer day 14, day 21, day 28, day 35, 42, and day 49. And then the 50th day, the ancient appointed time of Shavuot in 2012, would start at sunset on June 23rd until sunset of June 24th, if you count from the new moon, or sunset of June 24th until sunset of June 25th, if you count from the first crescent. So that was our first appointed times of 2012. Now let's look at the final three appoint, appointed times in 2012. Our first month started in the new moon of April 21st. So we'll just go to NASA's moon chart and count seven months from April 21st. So this would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you can see the seventh month starts on the new moon of October 15th. And the first visible crescent was on October 16th. Well, the reason I don't have a three-day window for the dates in this month is there was a huge sign that occurred on the first crescent of the moon on October 16th, 2012. And this was the sign described in Revelation 12, 1 through 5. It was a celestial configuration involving the constellation Virgo, the sun, the moon, and the planet Saturn. And it's very rare. The last time it occurred was in 1570. And it won't happen again until 2454. So for more details on that, you would need to check the links in the description below this video because it's too detailed to go into now. But the fact that this rare sign occurred exactly on the first crescent of the seventh new moon in 2012 is more than just significant. The fulfillments of the future appointed times of the Elohim that we're watching for can also be signs, as we can see in the meaning of the word right here. The Feast of Trumpets, or literally the appointed sign of trumpets, literally occurred on October 16th, 2012, and won't happen again for another 500 years. This is one of the biggest confirmations we could have had that this ancient calendar method for determining the true appointed times is correct. So the first day of this month is obviously the first crescent instead of the new moon because that was the day of the fulfillment of the appointed sign itself. As you can see here, the literal appointed sign of trumpets didn't occur alone. It was the third scriptural fulfillment in a row in 2012, and these were huge fulfillments. The 1290th day in the book of Daniel, the abomination of desolation or idol of terror that occurred August 2nd, 2012. Then the 1335th day occurring on the Standard Feast of Trumpets on September 16th and the Revelation 12 sign occurring on the True Feast of Trumpets on the ancient biblical calendar just a month later. And these events absolutely cannot be faked. Everything I'm showing you here can be independently verified using the free software Stellarium and three different online Bible concordances that provide complete definitions for these scriptures that I've linked below in the description of this video.
I mean, I realize how amazing it is, and that's why I will not stop trying to get this information out to as many people as possible because I know it's correct. So if you're new to my channel, we won't be covering all of these things in this video, so check the links listed below in the des description box. But next in this video, we're going to look at the lunar eclipses that landed on true Passover and true second Passover of 2013. So in 2013, we look at the full moon of February again, and we see that it made its turn from the winter position on the left to the summer position on the right. But the sun is still setting to the left of due west. So the turn did not occur on the full moon of February, so we wait until the full moon of March to check again. And on the full moon of March, the sun made its turn. So the first day of the month was the new moon of April 10th, or the first crescent of April 11th. Passover then fell on sunset of the 23rd until sunset of the 24th, if you count from the new moon, or sunset of the 24th until sunset of the 25th, if counting from the first crescent. And as you can see, there was a lunar eclipse on April 25th, which was Passover if we count from the first crescent of the moon. And there was also a lunar eclipse on May 25th, which was second Passover using the ancient calendar method, counting from the first crescent of the second month. So this second Passover here on the 14th day of the second month. So we had the literal fulfillment of the appointed sign of trumpets occur on the ancient calendar in 2012. Then two lunar eclipses on both Passover and second Passover in 2013. And in 2014, we have two solar eclipses occurring on the first day of the first month and the first day of the seventh month on the ancient calendar. But we'll cover that in another video. So I hope this was beneficial for you. And for more information on this subject in connection with other major events that happened in 2012 and 2013, you can check out my ebook, 2013 in the Bible and Other Ancient Texts, which is linked below this video in the description, along with many other videos on related subjects. So thank you so much to everyone who has been supportive of this work. I love you so much, and I hope you're doing well, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye-bye.